We are in our series, Gifted. This is the last week of this discussion series we've been talking about, Gifted. And we've been looking into that that very churchy, that very Christianese word, uh, bless, blessing, blessed. Uh, and sometimes it's, it's used as a derogatory term, right? You ever heard someone say something mean about someone and then followed up with bless her heart so it sounds a little nicer? Um, it, it's a pretty pretty commonly thrown around word, even in our modern culture. Uh, you'll find it in songs and in other things and uh, the way people uh, talk about things. So blessings is oftentimes misunderstood, misused word. And really, when you when you get into the Bible, first starting off into the Jewish scriptures, uh, you find that, that blessings are simply uh, words of honor. Giving someone a purpose is giving them a blessing. Children are referred to as a blessing. Uh, we find that that uh, oftentimes people want to bless someone, they give them good gifts. And we said in week one, when we we're just looking at kind of 30,000 foot view of this discussion, we said, we are blessed to be a blessing. The gifts that we have are not to just be gifts for us, but to be gifts to the world. And we are to use those responsibly to gift the world. And one type of gift that we that we uh, have and that we say that when you're part of a church, you are gifted. And those are called spiritual gifts. And maybe this is your first time ever hearing of something called a spiritual gift. And that maybe sounds uh, weird or, or woo-woo. Uh, it's not. It's, it's actually really practical ways uh, that we're all gifted to serve each other, to serve the church, and to serve our communities and to love people. And we said in week one that identifying our spiritual giftedness aligns us with our spiritual purposes. That, that the gifts you have, that God has a plan for you to use them in the world to make the world a better place for, for the good of others. And we got to examine uh, various spiritual gifts and, and some people took an assessment to see which spiritual gifts they had in their life. And we discussed those and it was a really meaningful discussion and we continued last week by saying unless you use it your gift is useless and we encourage people to find ways to get involved in using their giftedness and uh, specifically within the context of a community of faith and it was a really good discussion trying to get everyone involved and so this week we're going to conclude the series this way and here's our idea worth discussing i'm going to say at the top end and at the back so we can really kind of sandwich everything in as we conclude the series is this all gifts serve the church some gifts serve to lead the church and so we're going to talk about those gifts those roles that lead the church and the giftedness that those roles have and we're gonna uh, really just kind of be a short teaching time today and then we'd love to hear your thoughts in those discussion uh, breakout rooms um, about what we're talking about here so uh, let's jump right in and let's uh, look at what Paul said to the church at Ephesus he's writing a letter and he said this now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church the Apostles the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility, they have, a, they have a responsibility. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. So, so the church, one of the metaphors for this community of faith is a body and how each body has a part and each body um, has a role and a function just like our human bodies do. And it's almost like here he's saying the responsibility of these certain gifts and these certain church leaders is simply this, is to equip that body and to strengthen and build up that body. It's kind of like uh, spiritual personal trainers, right? It's to, it's to get into the lives of these people who have gifts and they're part of this community of faith known as the church and to help them, to strengthen them, to build them up. And I would say even to go out into the community and get more people in using their giftedness and built up. They have a leadership responsibility based on their giftedness. So today I'm just gonna do a quick overview of what it means to be a pastor, an elder, an overseer, or a bishop, depending on what kind of church maybe you grew up in or churches you're familiar with, you would hear different um, terminology for it, but um, no matter what it's translated as, all kinds of has, has the same idea of this church leadership and these roles. Um, at Downtown Faith, we call this role pastor. Some churches call it elders, overseers, or bishops, um, all meaning really ultimately 
the same thing. So let's let's look at more about it. It says in the Acts of the Apostles. So this was uh, this was kind of a, a chronicling of the early church right when they got started. And, and and the Acts of the Apostles is a really exciting book to read because so much is going on with this brand new community, this brand new uh, revolutionary movement of love known as the church. And it says this: among the prophets and teachers of the church that we saw are those are gifted, uh, certain giftings and certain roles. At Antioch of Syria were Barnabas, Simeon, Lucius, Manian, the childhood companion of King Herod Antipas. So they kind of like uh, signify this guy had a very powerful friend. And Saul. One day as these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Appoint Barnabas and Saul for the special work to which I have called them. So after more fasting and prayer, the men laid their hands on them and sent them on their way. And we're going to see that Paul and Barnabas began to take missionary journeys and to start churches and to be pastors of pastors is ultimately what they become. And we see this, that pastors, elders, overseers, bishops, they're called. They're called. And they're not called by people. You know, when I, when I was growing up um, uh, in, in my Baptist church, it was like the, the role of pastor was so elevated that like every family wanted their sons to become pastors, right? Every, every family wanted their daughters to become pastors' wives because the daughters couldn't become pastors in, in that tradition. And so they, they get as close as they can, right? So be married to a pastor and, and it was, you know, you were uh, mama called and daddy sent, they said, right? And this was, this was so important to these families. That's what it was. But ultimately, it's not humans that call these pastors this role, it is, it is a compelling of the Spirit of God in your heart to lead. It, it, is a, it is a compelling to use your giftedness in these leadership roles within the community of faith. And so a, a pastor that is, is called, and that doesn't make them special in some other way that other people aren't. It's just this compelling to this leadership role within a church that not everyone has, and maybe other people desire it, but they feel this, this compelling from the very spirit of God. Now let's continue to, to look into the New Testament. So Paul is also going to write a letter uh, to one of the places, he's going to write to a leader in one of the places where he started a church. And this leader's name is Titus. And he's going to give Titus some instructions and some things for us to learn about what it means to be a pastor and to use that giftedness. In the letter to Titus, Paul says, I left you on the island of Crete so you could complete our work and appoint elders in each town as I instructed you. So like all of the towns in this area, and they all have these little gatherings of, of, uh, of these Jesus gatherings, these communities of faith. I want you to go around and appoint elders in each town as I instructed you. And he's going to give us some very interesting insight into what it means to be a pastor or an elder. It says, an elder must live a blameless life. That's pretty heavy, right? That's pretty, that's okay, okay. I'm, if, you're, if you're wanting to be an elder, you kind of feel this. If you're wanting to be a pastor, you feel this. He must be faithful to his wife. And his children must be believers who don't have a reputation for being wild or rebellious. So not the normal, what we call PKs, right? The preacher's kids were always the worst in Sunday school, right? Uh, if you grew up in church, you understand that. Um, it says a church leader is a manager of God's household. So he must live a blameless life. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered. He must not be a heavy drinker, violent, or dishonest with money. And then he's going he's gonna to kind of juxtapose, he's going to compare it here to this. He says, rather, he must enjoy having guests in his home and he must love what is good and he must live wisely and be just he must live a devout and disciplined life he must have a strong belief in the trustworthy message he was taught then he will be able to encourage others with wholesome teaching and show those who oppose it where they are wrong and what we see paul give here and we see uh paul's going to give these two other uh, um, mentees that he has and other pastors that are leading pastors in these various areas, and they are simply qualifications. So a pastor is called, but also qualified. Now, when you read those qualifications, if you're anything like me, 
sitting here as the pastor of Downtown Faith, I feel a very heavy weight. And that is one of the things that pastors feel because their life can be at times under a microscope, but also just the idea of living my life in this way that was described feels very heavy. But I want to say to you this, that all of these qualifications are worthy aspirations for anyone who follows Jesus, right? Like the idea that you would want, that you would love what's good, that you would be just, that you would um, be faithful to your spouse, that you would raise your kids well, that you would be good with money, that, that you wouldn't be arrogant. Like these are things that you would love to have people in your home. These are all things that, that we can all aspire to. They're, they're things that we can all put out in front of us as goals in our life to live a devoted and disciplined life. Most of us would say, yeah, I want to live that way. And it's simply saying here that like what you're looking for in a pastor is as, as Titus would go around to these towns, the, the, the people you're looking for are going to be people like this. They're going to have these qualifications, but these are qualifications that any of us could have. And I would even say that we should have in our life and should strive to have in our life. But it's especially important for a pastor because of this right here. I love this quote. You cannot pass on what you do not first possess. You cannot preach and teach a life that you do not have of your own. We have a word for that. It's called hypocrisy. And more and more and more in culture, you're finding spiritual leaders and pastors and people of faith-based organizations in power being exposed because they are trying to pass on something that they do not first possess. And it hurts them, their family, and their organization that they're trying to lead. So again, there is a way, but it is simply because you are trying to live any life uh, a life that anyone would live that is following Jesus. Now, we saw earlier in, in, the, letter, in the, um, the Acts of the Apostles, in that book, we saw how Paul and Barnabas were sent out, and uh, they, were, they were called by the Spirit and then sent out by these other church leaders, and then we're going we're gonna to catch up with them uh, a chapter later, and we're going to see what they do. It's going to give us one more thing to look at. It says, Paul and Barnabas also appointed elders in every church. With prayer and fasting, they turned the elders over to the care of the Lord in whom they have put their trust. So they would appoint people, and then they would turn them over to the Lord, right? So sometimes, the reason I say this is that sometimes the idea of becoming a pastor, if it's ever brought up to, to, just, to a person that's just been faithful in their church, right? They're just involved, and they're demonstrating these qualities, and maybe a pastor like myself will go to them and say, hey, have you ever thought about being a pastor, have you ever thought about leading in a church? And the biggest fear most people have is, oh, now I got to go to seminary. Or now I've got to pass all of these, these qualifying things. And, and, and a lot of denominations and a lot of church groups have like all these hoops they want people to jump through. And here what we see is that when the church first started, it was, are you called? Are you qualified? Okay, then we then we appoint you, right? We ordain you. We put you in that role and then we turn you over to Jesus and we trust and you trust Jesus in this leadership role. It wasn't about checking off all the boxes, these man-made boxes. It was about, are you called? Are you qualified? Then let's appoint you and put you in that role. Ordained is just a big word. It simply means the act of placing called qualified people into a role of pastor. Elder, overseer, bishop. And these are people who possess that calling and they are qualified. Maybe they have those giftings that you need to, to lead a church and to hold that responsibility of equipping people and building up. But I want to say one more thing about this role of pastor. This, this one more weighty thing, because you can have all the skills and you can have all the knowledge and you can have all the giftings. And it's still not going to be enough to bear the weight that some people feel when they lead the church and Paul David Tripp wrote a book called Dangerous Calling and it's it's really good book for people who are considering what it means to be a pastor and is that something for them he says the ministry you are doing is never just shaped by your gifts knowledge skill and experience it is always also shaped by the true condition of your heart 
pastors have to have to guard and watch and monitor and keep a finger on the pulse of their heart. How are you leading? Where are you leading from? What are your intentions? What are your personal ego-driven agendas that you have to push aside and you have to literally kill off every day? I've got to kill that that ego, agenda-driven leadership, and I've got to lead from a heart condition that is following hard after Jesus and loves people. That's how you will find a successful pastor. It's not based on their skills, their knowledge, their giftings. Those things are great. I, I went and got all those things when I wanted to become a pastor. But I'll tell you this, pastors are people who struggle with that same ego, who struggle with our heart condition, that, that, that struggle with life. And we have some of the same uh, ills that, that anyone else has and the same trials that anyone else has. We can, we can feel things and become bitter. That cannot be the condition of our heart as we lead. And so one of the things that a pastor is always gonna do is monitor that so that they can lead and lead from a right place. Because all gifts serve the church. Some gifts serve to lead the church.